I'm 38. I've had pain since I was 10. I would take medication for three weeks out of every month. I would be on morphine for 24 hours. I take ibuprofen, Plexia, and Endone. Nurofen, Ponstan, Codeine or morphine based pain relief. So at the most severe I was taking quite a lot of Endone. Endone, morphine patches, Panadine Fords, Tarjan, Lyrica, uh, Cymbalta and Endep. Um, like the list is endless. Tramadol, because it's a slow release. In my early 20s, I took a lot of Endone, a um, lot of Oxy, um, Panadine Fort. These drugs just weren't touching the sides. I think I was potentially seen in, as having drug-seeking behaviour. Uh, fentanyl injections, buprenorphine tablets. So I've been on Endone uh, since for around three years. I was 21 and it wasn't until I got a stomach ulcer from overusing um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories um, that the doctors finally sort of took me seriously and also a bit of a wake-up call to me. I was put on to different antidepressants and anxiety medication like Valpro, Endep, Arapax, Eleva. I was needing to take a handful of pills just to get out of bed in the morning. An anaesthetist at the women's hospital who said it could be endo but I think really what's happened here is the endo has affected your nerves. I got a rhizotomy which is a sort of laser treatment on that nerve which after three sort of episodes or sessions of that treatment was very very effective and very um, has been kind of permanently successful for me which is really lucky. <laughs> like I've kind of got a bit of a management plan um, for the pain specialist if I present to ED they have easy access to this plan so that there's no uh, prolonged waiting around in excruciating pain. So it got to a point where I actually went cold turkey for 12 months. The pain is a lot more manageable than it was, but it's rare now for me to take anything over a Panadine Fort. Well, they're pretty powerful messages, aren't they? And show the challenges women experience in using a wide range of medications. So hopefully, um, I'm going to take you through very briefly some of the neuroscience behind why we choose to use some of these medications and hopefully put them into a bit of context for you. So I'd like to thank Leslie and Syl for inviting me to speak today. Um, I hope I make sense because neuroscience of pain is very complex and uh, can be quite challenging to understand even for those of us in the business. So here we go. Briefly, we'll just touch on what a definition of pain might look like. How does the nervous system create our experience of pain? What changes occur when pain becomes persistent? And then look a little bit at some medications that haven't been mentioned so far. And gradually, I think over the day, you're going to get the impression that there is no one clear solution for uh, any one person. It's a very individual journey and then we'll try and uh, look at where do some of these medicines fit. Pain is defined by the International Association for the Study of Pain as an experience. It's not simply a sensation, it's not imaginary, it's a response created by the brain and it has these elements, both a sensory element, so it does feel a bit like a sensation, but it also has meaning for us and has these very important emotional elements to it. So why do we get pain? It's a response to some sort of danger. And that's a very, very broad definition. Danger can come in all sorts of forms. We also have specialised nerves and uh, this process called nociception. And it's really those two things together that create our experience of acute pain. So that's short-term pain that we often can say, this happened to me, I've got my warning signal, pain, and it's going to make me go and do something about it. I'm going to tell you that pain is all in the brain. And by that I don't mean that you've made it up or that it's imaginary, but it's the end result of complex processing all the way from the peripheral tissues 
to many regions of the brain and back down again. So if we start out with this idea of trauma, some threat, and in endometriosis, of course, if we think about the disease itself, it certainly is a threat to our well-being. It's creating bleeding and discomfort and a whole wide range of other symptoms, making us feeling pretty terrible. So it might fit in that class of internal threat. We have these specialised nerves that conduct impulses to the central nervous system about what's going on in the periphery. And in endo, particularly these little C fibres seem to be more uh, prolific, get more of them in the lining of the uterus and probably more of them in the lesions themselves. They come into the spinal cord where they link up with the next nerve that goes up the spinal cord to the brain. And in the brain, it comes in here to this thalamic area, which is kind of like a central hub, like um, central station, you might call it. And from there, we get uh, a whole network of nerves lining, lighting up all over the brain, going to all sorts of different areas, trying to localise it. So it goes to this area known as the somatosensory cortex, that kind of helps us say, well, where is this problem? Um, we might need part of this impulse goes up to the motor cortex. Do we need to take some activity to get away from it? And you'll notice a lot of women curl up in a tight little ball. It helps relieve some of that uh, discomfort. Obviously, we need to mount a stress response. We've got some sort of danger happening. There's a threat to us. We need to mount a stress response, so that is in another specialised area of the brain there. Comes here to the front of our brain, this prefrontal cortex, where we try to make sense of it. What does it mean for us? Uh, do we need to act on this straight away? And as I said, it has this emotional element to it as well. And that drags in memory and associations from the past. All of that put together, actually generates downward impulses that come back down here and can modify the incoming stimulus here in the spinal cord. And this is an important pathway because it's often not as strong as usual when pain persists. So overarching all of that then is some genetic predisposition. We know with endometriosis it can run in families a number of pain syndromes run in families. So there is some strong genetic inheritance involved. That's something we probably can't do a lot about. Our early life experiences are important because they help to um, hone our um, stress responses. They also teach us how to look after ourselves. And past the pain experiences influence our current pain experience. Pain is a learnt process, and so it depends on our past experiences. So all of those things we may or may not be able to do a great deal about when we're looking at pain on a particular day of your life. Going back to that neuroscience idea, how does this all happen? Those specialised nerves I was talking to you about. So this is a um, representation of the A-delta fibre. Um, and there are also some other fibres known as A-beta fibres that this, the alpha, beta, delta, whatever name is really just related to this insulating sheath here, the myelin sheath, which helps speed the electrical impulses along the nerve. We have specialised nerve endings that can detect things like pressure, uh, temperature, and also changes in the acidity of the tissues. And ordinarily, uh, out in the skin, they have particularly these specialised nerve endings that if they're activated, they set up an electrical impulse going along the nerve here. It comes into this area, which is at the spinal cord level, and eventually up to the brain where we might recognise it as touch or change in temperature or something like that. Similarly with the changes in the uterus, specialised endings there, uh, generate a very similar process, but we might recognise that or describe that as being a, a cramping, maybe discomfort. It doesn't necessarily have to be severe pain. 
what happens when things get outside that normal range? An example would be putting your hand against a hot plate. If you're not too close to it, you notice, oh, that's nice and warm. But if you put your hand too close, it's likely to do tissue damage. You will say, oh, that's painful. It's actually then activating some of these silent nerves that are not normally involved in ordinary sensation. That's called a nociceptor or the C fiber. And once they're activated, they then set up electrical impulses going into the spinal cord that actually change the sensitivity of the system and start to amplify what's going on so that by the time it gets up to our brain and it gets processed, it's saying, this is really important. You've got to take notice of me here. It's no longer that, oh, yeah, I noticed that it was a bit warm. It's, watch out, there's tissue damage going to happen. And this can happen then with other things. If pressure becomes too great, we say, oh, if somebody's squeezing your arm, oh, you're hurting me, you're, and you end up with a bruise, you've got the tissue damage. So these get activated when that um, normal range is exceeded. The same will happen then if there are things outside the normal going on in the uterus, in the pelvis, or in any other tissue, in fact. The nociceptors get activated and then they start to amplify what's going on in the central nervous system. So nociception is this process of turning the noxious stimulus into an electrical code that activates and enhances or uh, amplifies the system. So what's happening at a cellular level? I'm not going to dwell on this too much. You've heard about um, the endocannabinoid systems. There are a whole range of other systems. There are different receptors, these NMDA receptors, AMPA receptors, just to mention a couple. We get changes in what's going on in the um, actual way the nerves are conducting things, so that's the ion channels, because that, that is what creates this electrical impulse. But we also get changes in the downward descending inhibitory control pathways, and we get some reductions in what's hap happening there as pain persists. Overall, then, we get changes in the way the nervous system is functioning, and we end up with this condition called central sensitization. That's where we can experience spontaneous activity. You might have heard people describe uh, a sudden shooting electrical shock type of pain. That can be spontaneous activity in the nervous system. We get a reduced threshold for activation. A lot of people talk about, oh, but I have a high pain threshold. I think what they're meaning is they have high pain tolerance. They've been living with pain for a long time. They just put up with it. This is a change in threshold. It means all of that processing is more easily activated because you have that change in sensitivity. And what we also see is this idea of an enlargement of the receptive field. It feels like the pain is spreading. And that's because more and more nerves get involved in the nervous system in transmitting those messages. So that we're sort of amplifying things uh, as pain persists for longer and longer. This idea of central sensitization then, we have a change in what's happening here where it was things outside of our normal range activating our nociceptors and going up the system creating this state of hyperalgesia or more sensitivity. And we also can develop this situation where normal things now can trigger that pathway because at the spinal cord level there are these other little connecting nerves. They're called interneurons or the nerves themselves develop new branches onto this sensitised nerve in the spinal cord and that then can easily activate pain. How many of you have had that feeling of something that you would normally perceive as not causing pain causes pain? Yeah, a lot, a lot of you, yeah. That's your allodynia or your hyperalgesia. And it's a change in the way the nervous system is processing that information. It's not that simple though. We've got another player that we're learning more and more about, the immune system. 
So it's not just the nervous system itself, but it's the immune system getting in on the act and changing the sensitivity of the system as well. So we see changes here in the peripheral nerves. They uh, create messenger molecules that go on to sensitize this nociceptor. And the important area that we're learning more and more about are these specialized cells, they're called glia. They're specialized immune cells in the nervous system itself. And they seem to be a part of the system that gets sensitized and activated and act like memory cells. And they can change the sensitivity of what's going on in the nerves themselves. So what if we do um, functional MRI and see what's going on in the brain itself? In a number of chronic pain conditions now, we see these sorts of changes in volumes of the brain and indications that the brain itself is also changing in response to that ongoing input. So pain syndromes, when they're persisting, become a type of brain disorder. And I would suggest to you that visceral pain, by that I mean pain arising from the organs in our body, also becomes a brain disorder. It's no longer localised, it's just the problem of the endo in the pelvis. It changes all up the system. And that's what make, makes it so hard to work out what medicine do I take to help manage it. So what have we got? We've got the glial cells detecting and remembering uh, these danger signals. They can be pretty easily activated. We get changes in nociception where that is more easily activated and we get changes in the brain. And all together, that makes up persistent pain. So back to what medications can help us. We've heard about uh, a little bit about anti-inflammatories, or at least they've been mentioned. We've heard about the uh, cannabinoids. They certainly may well have a place. We're still kind of trying to work that out, I think. By what we know now about all these complex receptors, messenger molecules, uh, the way the nerves function, can we find medications that uh, work on those pathways to affect some sort of improvement or change. So we might want to be looking at medications that attach onto opioid receptors. We know they're there, very important. We might want some that block those messenger molecules in the way they um, communicate between the nerves. We might want something that changes the way the nerves conduct electrical activity at them, and so on. So the thinking really is by knowing or understanding what these various mechanisms are, we might be able to make better use of our medications and make a bit more sense of what might be helpful. Basically, we want medications that might work here at the periphery, and that's where anti-inflammatories are all important. We might want to look at some of the um, medications that work on the spinal cord itself or those that are working on the brain. You've probably tried a number of these, the things that would reduce central sensitization, like Lyrica, Neurontin, Topiramate. They're working on reducing excitation. The others, the antidepressants uh, in particular, are trying to um, increase that inhibitory pathways. And then some of these uh, newer sort of opioid or their mixed opioid drugs might do a little bit of both. There's a, a range of them working by various different mechanisms, and I won't go into them in great detail. Happy to talk to people later if you like. But you'll notice here they have a wide range of effects. That's because they're working on the nervous system, and these are the things that limit what, how you can take those medications. We know about other options, Botox, uh, some of the topical creams. Compounding pharmacists will make them up. Some of the pain units will use intravenous therapies even. And of course, you want to treat other symptoms. So it might be treating irritable bowel syndrome. It might be trying to treat bladder pain syndrome as well. The opioids I'm just going to quickly mention, they have a place, but they can be very problematic. Long list of side effects if you take them acutely. 
we also are finding out that prolonged use might even make pain worse. The research in this area is still fairly new, but I think that is also some people's experience. And of course, it's already been mentioned that they can actually be quite dangerous in prolonged use and particularly high doses. So where does medication fit in the big picture? It fits as just one part of a whole range of treatments. And each person has to work out what is the balance of all of those things for them. So the golden rule, uh, it's looking a bit too golden on the screen there. The golden rule with medication is start low and build up slow because these medications can be very powerful, they're working on your nervous system and they have a wide range of side effects. So you want to be on the lowest dose possible. Maybe a combination is going to help. There is no easy, clear, simple answer. If you want to know more about your medications, the National Prescribing Service has a fantastic website that is independent, is not a company pushing any particular barrow. You can find about every medication on the Australian market on this website. And if you want some practical tips on how to use those medications, we've got some fact sheets on the Poet Pain Foundation website. So that's really about all I have to say in um, uh, as short time available. Very happy to talk to people uh, in some more detail if you'd like. <laughs>